think what he does for his patients is amazing, and I want to get some of his determination into this portrait. What made you become a doctor? I remember thinking as a kid that I, I wonder if I could be a brain surgeon. And I used to try and uh, try and put the uh, inside of a biro pen into a pen without touching the edges. Just oh. see how steady my hand was. Wow. And I used to practice that to make sure my hand was steady. Yeah. yeah. There were many other things I wanted to be. Like I wanted to be a garbage collector at one stage and used to see those guys collecting the bins in the morning and, and were wearing tank tops with big muscles and I thought, shit, I'd like to be like that one day. <laughs> So, I, so mum said, oh, no, maybe, maybe you should think about something else. But in terms of going into medicine in the first place, no, it was just one of those things that Chinese kids do. <laughs> yeah. Why brain surgery? Like the hardest thing you can do. That's it. That's the reason. It's the hardest thing you can do. Absolutely. And there's very few people who would uh, be critical of that statement. It's, it's, it is the world's hardest subspecialty in medicine. It's uh, emotionally taxing. Most people die. About 70% of all the brain tumours that we deal with are malignant, so they're going to die, they're cancers. So that in itself is emotionally wrenching. It's physically taxing because it's hours and hours standing, operating for hours under a microscope. What's the longest that you've gone? Uh, 26 hours. W one operation? One operation, 26 hours. Mm. This is a probably a silly question. Did you eat or go to the bathroom, etc.? I went to the bathroom at 12 midnight. It started about 8 o'clock in the morning. And at 12 minutes, I went to the bathroom, sat down to have something to eat and have a bit of a rest. My, my colleague had taken over. And then, unfortunately, my colleague got in some trouble with some bleeding and stuff, so I had to rush back in again. And So I really only had about 10 minutes break. Yeah. Which and is mostly urinating the whole 10 minutes. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the middle of an intense operation. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's a tough one. Mm. How do you get through that? For me, it's easy. What I do is I pretend that the person on the table is someone who I love, my wife, my children, my mum. So I just presume that they're a loved one. And what would I want my surgeon to do if they were operating on you know, my loved one? Tell me about the John Wayne thing. Given that my father was an absent father and I was always looking for a father, a role model, I can remember, well, I watched a lot of TV and I can remember thinking John Wayne was a sort of man that I'd like to be. Tough, didn't say much, incredibly courageous. So he became my role, role model and sort of my uh, father figure. And I never told anyone this, of course, because it was a bit embarrassing, but I'd keep it in the back of my mind. And when things would, you know, when I'd come to a crossroads or, I'd, or times would get tough, I'd think, OK, now what would John Wayne do? What would John, <laughs> do? What would John Wayne do? <laughs> and believe, that, believe it or not, I carried that right into my adulthood from being a kid. And I can remember Aaron McMillan, this... Uh, oh, the uh, pianist. The yes. pianist. Yes. Uh, Young pianist, very yeah. good. Prodigy. Yeah. yeah, a lovely person. And he had this terrible brain tumour right in the middle of his piano playing part of his brain, you know, the visuospatial coordination part of his brain. Mm. And so we had Australian Story TV crew in the operating room. Uh, I had pressure uh, of the fact that he was such a great pianist. Uh, I had the pressure of people watching me. I had the pressure of people wanting me to fail because I knew that a lot of people had said that this was inoperable. Some people had said that I'd be foolish to even try and take it on. Uh, so I had all this pressure on me. And I can remember about six hours into the operation, I was tired, my shoulders were hurting, I'd hardly got any tumour out, the brain was starting to swell out a bit, and I started to lose control of the, of the tumour and I couldn't barely see it. And, oh, God, it was just terrible. And I was thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? <laughs> And then I stood back for like, it must have been only for about two or three seconds, but it seemed like a lifetime. I stood back and I go, OK, now what would John Wayne do? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so I composed myself. I sort of took a big, deep breath and uh, just kept at it and at it. And finally I got the tumour out and everything was good. Yeah. Wow. It took me 14 hours, that case. Sadly, the tumour returned and Aaron McMillan died in 2007, six years after his first surgery. In that time, he managed to perform and record an impressive collection of work. And like a lot of other patients, he formed a special bond with his surgeon. 
It takes its toll. You know, I've, I've been criticised for developing this relationship with patients. And people who are smarter than me and more wise than me have said, Charlie, you're just crazy doing that. It's going to take its toll. And they're right. If you can maintain a sort of a distance with your patients and sort of keep them on the other side of the desk, I think you could probably stay in the game a bit longer. Uh, but then the flip side is you don't get the joy and the fulfilment of developing a relationship with someone as well. So you've just got to take the good with the bad. What is it like when you lose someone? Oh, it's just terrible. It just tears you apart. Because it is, it's because of you. You know, if someone dies during surgery, you can't blame anyone else except you. You can try and blame the disease and blame this and blame that, blame the anaesthetists and blame your assistant and your nursing staff and stuff, but the bottom line is the buck stops with you, it's your fault. And so you've got to, you've got to carry that on your own shoulders. How do you deal with that? Well, I deal with it because I know that I, I've done the best I can. If you're doing the best you can and you believe there's no one else who can do better, and, uh, and you're doing it in the patient's best interest and you lose them, then you just have to receive some sort of comfort that, you know, it's the best you can do and shit happens. Have you had to walk outside and tell um, oh, a patient's yeah. family that it hasn't worked out? It hasn't worked out well or they haven't woken up from surgery. Oh, God, it's just terrible, huh? It's the worst thing about my job. I can remember crying downstairs after Fiona died. Fiona was this girl who was... Oh, God, she was beautiful. She would have been like the Prime Minister of Australia. She was head girl at NEGS uh, up at Armidale. She was an amazing person. And when she died, it really hurt me. How old was she when you operated on? Uh, I think she was in her tw early 20s. She was at university. And she was just one of those girls who you know is a winner. When she got a brain tumour, she uh, had a bald head because of the radiotherapy and so everyone else went bald for her and, uh, I mean, she had that sort of impact on people around her. And I operated on her maybe two or three times, I forget now, and kept her alive and she was incredibly courageous through that and I just can't, I'll never forget the last time when she got a recurrence and I said to her, Fiona, I can operate again, you know, and keep you alive and she said, no, I think it's about time to... So sort of call it quits. And she had the courage to go, no, I'm going to dictate my own death now. Dictate her own life, and now she was dictating her own death. Gosh. Uh, and I and can remember God. when she died, I just openly sobbed and just cried. I mean, I just feel like crying now thinking about it. And, uh, and I can remember kids finding me downstairs crying and, and asking me why I was crying. Anyway, yeah. Charlie Teo is a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, but he sometimes upsets his fellow fellows. He's a pioneer in minimally invasive surgical techniques for brain cancer and takes on cases other surgeons say are inoperable. I never wanted to be a controversial neurosurgeon. <laughs> I never wanted to be sort of out there and doing things that other people weren't doing, but it just so happens that what I do best and what I feel should be done for patients is something that's not mainstream. And, you know, if, if you have a difficult case and everyone else says it's inoperable and you know that if you operate and things go wrong, then it's almost like professional suicide. So to save yourself, you go, oh, no, it's inoperable. So you think a lot of doctors lean towards safety? I've had a doctor come to my office and tell me, and this is a surgeon who I have a lot of respect for, he was asked by, the, you know, all my colleagues, I guess, to come and speak to me. He sat down and he goes, Charlie, you've got to stop doing this. You're really pissing a lot of people off. Mm. I go, stop doing what? He says, stop operating on patients that others have called inoperable. Mm. But I go, hang on, do you want me to say that a tumour is inoperable even though I think I can take it out? And he goes, yeah. And I go, OK, OK, here, look at this X-ray. Look at that tumour. Do, do you think you can take that out? And he goes, yeah, of course I can. I go, well, that patient has been told that that tumour is inoperable. So you want me to now call up that mother and say that that tumour is inoperable and I'm going to let you die? Mm. And he goes, yes, I do that every day. Mm. Every day he lies mm. so he doesn't piss off his colleagues and he doesn't give second opinions that are different to someone else's opinion. Mm. Is, is it because, mainly because you make them look bad? Why would I try and make my colleagues look bad? Mm. And I don't want to do that. Some of them are my friends. 
And so that's never the intention. Unfortunately, that's what happens because they kind of make themselves look bad. What have you sort of learned about life? It's very fragile. God, shit, on. So fragile. And again, it's that fine balance. You know, we're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time. But then again, we might be here for a long time. So <laughs> don't, don't waste it. Don't, don't waste it being angry with people. Don't waste it, you know, joining ISIS. Yeah, I get angry when I see such anger in the world. <laughs> I mean, road rage, street rage, office rage, fucking surf rage now. <laughs> I mean, life is too short. Is, is it true, though, you, you once nearly got ran over by a murderer when you were on your bike and so you punched him and you ended up in jail for the night? Yeah, but, you know, that's not, that's not road rage. That's just like uh, eye for an eye. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm, you were young. I'm not uh, this person sitting up here going, you know, you're a bad person because you showed road rage. I'm, I'm guilty of road rage. But the trouble is we get consumed by all these little things that happen in our lives. But what I'm trying to say is that you should try not to. Mm. You should always try and think of the big picture. It's very easy for me because I've got people dying every day around me. But here's the bad thing about it. The people who aren't reminded every day about the big picture, you've got to deal with those people. Mm. When I go home, for example, and my wife is worried about the neighbour who's making a lot of noise, I'd love to be able to say to her, what are you worried about? I had an eight-year-old girl die today. And, uh, but she didn't have an eight-year-old girl die today. Mm. So it's unfair for me to think that, oh, hang on, you should see the big picture. Yeah. So, you know, that's the bad side to my life. The bad side to my life and people dying is that, yes, it makes me see the big picture, but I also expect other people to see the big picture. Mm. And, it's, and that's a, I think that's a little bit unfair. How many lives do you think you've saved? Well, th- I mean, I've saved thousands of lives because I've operated on thousands of people that have been told that the tumours were inoperable and they weren't. And uh, so, yeah, I've been... Again, I'm not saying it to boast, but I'm saying it because it's a great, great privilege. Mm. Do you think you're like one of the best? Yeah, I'm the best. <laughs> Shit, aren't <laughs> You want to be painting me if it wasn't. <laughs> No, if you truly care for your patient, truly care for your patient, then if you don't think you're the best, you're going to refer that patient to someone who you do think is the best. Mm. So in many ways, any doctor who cares for the patient's got to think they're the best. Mm. Well, you wouldn't be doing it otherwise. Now, there's a lot of things that I don't think I'm the best at, and I refer those patients on to who I think is the best. Mm. But when it comes to brain tumours, there's no better. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.